uh, such a pleasure to move to Pro Professor Lisa Manning at Syracuse University, um, who is um, going to tell us about living very many varied, interesting, amazing histories. Over to you, Lisa. Thanks for the introduction, Sri. And I have to say, um, my imposter syndrome alarm is totally going off after the two amazing talks already by Juan and Regina. So um, it's always, you know, following great talks is always challenging. Um, so the interestingly, I, I really enjoy the series and I've watched a lot of it, uh, you know, in recorded form. And I, the story, the overarching story, I think of mine, uh, it is thinking about mentors. And when I think about serendipity or luck, I think about how lucky it was that I was, you know, sort of born at a time and a place where I had both a lot, I got lucky enough to have lots of female mentors and lots of um, male mentors who were really allies. And I'm not sure that would have happened if I had been born any earlier than I was. And I'd say my first sort of allies and mentors are my parents. So we have a great, you know, 80s picture. I grew up in Fort Thomas, Kentucky. Um, I have like 40 first cousins. These are my first cousins. A lot of people don't move away from there. All the kids in my high school, very few of them move away from where they grew up, stuff like that, right? So um, the reason that I am, you know, I think I dreamed big in part was my mom who's here is was a, a, a civil engineer. She was one of the first civil engineers who graduated sort of, you know, at the University of Kentucky, there were very few others. It was very, you know, it was a big deal for her. And my dad was also an engineer. They wanted me to be an engineer. I also failed to be an engineer. Um, but um, they both really like, they always thought I could do it, right? They never thought I couldn't do the math or the science or whatever, you know, because of my gender. And so they were, they, they, my dad would answer so many questions about like, how do transformers work, you know, like all the time. So I'm very grateful to them and my family. Um, and then the other person that was really transformative was um, I went to an all girls Catholic high school and I have some feelings about that, but I will say that um, sister Mary Ethel Parrott, I think is single-handedly, she's none. She's like, not very conservative at all. She's amazing. And she, um, I think is single-handedly responsible for a huge fraction of the science, women in science from Northern Kentucky. She ran the science fair club. And so like when I was um, in high school, I worked on a science fair project on microbial fuel cells, which was my first modeling biophysical systems, I guess. Um, and uh, it was really great for me because um you know, there was a sense that there was, again, a sense of expansion, a sense that anything could be done. And she really promoted that in people. And so I'm grateful for her. So mine is a story of mentors. I'm very grateful for the people around me. But when I developed this talk, it was just these singular people who were in a place um, were so useful. Um, and then I went to college at the University of Virginia. And um, I had to go to a place where I could get a merit-based scholarship because I was financially independent from the time I was 17. And so Brad Cox worked on the fixed target, so high energy experiments. And I was in a class of his and I gave a presentation and I had to work through college. And if I hadn't gotten a job working in like a research lab, I would have been waiting tables or something. And Brad Cox like comes across as like a cranky old person, but <laughs> he basically sort of single-handedly gave a freshman in college a summer job doing research on a high energy experiment. Like he let me work owl shifts at Fermilab. And um, again, these folks are folks who really, I think were there and present and gave an opportunity maybe to somebody who didn't look like an expectation of somebody who was doing science um, at the time. So I'm grateful for that. Um, and then um, I, I was a ski bum for a year. So partially this was because actually, because I was, I, I had to pay off some college debt because it's really hard to get through college just some merit scholarships, even working full time over the summers. And so I actually spent half the year living with my parents and paying off all the rest of the debt from college. Um, and then I spent the other half the year as a ski bum. And that was great. And I, I think that, um, you know, it was it was like a great break um, from doing all of the intellectual stuff. But the thing that happened again is this, I was done skiing in like April of that year and I'd gotten into UC Santa Barbara. So the next place I went was UC Santa Barbara and I didn't know any better, but like I basically asked Jean Carlson sight unseen 
to sponsor me to do research in the summer before I arrived <laughs> at UC Santa Barbara, which is again, not normal. And I didn't know that. I was too stupid to know that. And so Jean totally took a chance on another person, like a totally random person who had just been a ski bum. So clearly I had lost some brain cells and, you know, she took a chance on me anyway. And the science there was really fun. I, I, I went to talk to her because I was really, I thought the non-equilibrium sort of physics of like traffic and forest fires were really cool. And my favorite thing about that, well, there's many favorite things about the time um, working with Jean, but at the beginning of my graduate school, I worked on something called highly optimized tolerance models for forest fires. And so the abbreviation for that was HOT. And so you can see here that I had a bunch of folders called HOT models <laughs> for a while. And I can't, I, all of my grad student friends really got a kick out of all of my HOT models binders that I had as a graduate student. Um, and then I got, those were great, but I really got interested in materials. Like I really got interested in um, thinking about, um, so forest fires were cool, but I felt like there was a little bit of a disconnect between the model and the science, it was a little harder to make those connections quantitatively. And so I started talking to Jim Langer, um, who again, was just really so generous with the time. He was like, at the time, I think the president of the APS. And again, I should have probably not gone and knocked on his door, but I didn't know better and I did. And so uh, these folks and Jim in particular, really sort of took me under the wing and like gave me an opportunity to think about problems and materials. And so I got really excited about disordered systems and I worked on continual models um, for more systems based on like this idea of shear transformation zones. And so sort of towards the end of my PhD, um, there were two transformative things that really decided what I was gonna do next. And they were both important and I wanna highlight both. So one is, I met my partner, my future partner <laughs> in graduate school. And, um, you know, he was fantastic because he was another person that just supported what I wanted to do 100%, no matter what it was. And the and the second thing that happened is I went to this um, workshop at the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics um, that was called the, you know, Physics and Biology of Morphogenesis. And there was like, the lineup of this thing was amazing. And there were people that were using, I thought, really exciting quantitative testable models for the biology of tissues. And I just thought this was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And so I really wanted to go and work on it. And so when I was thinking about postdoctoral opportunities, I had some. And one of the opportunities would have taken me away from my partner, from Will, like uh, for a long, you know, for, for years. And the other one was a place where we could kind of live in the same place and work together. And so, you know, I kind of made the decision partially because like I, I went to, to Princeton next and I partially made that decision because there were really amazing people doing bi biophysics there. But being 100% honest, it was because I wasn't willing to live away from my partner anymore. Um, and so I'll come back to that at the end in, in well, in like two minutes <laughs> at the end of the short talk. So I decided to go to Princeton and, you know, things never work out <laughs> the way you think they're going to work out. And so I was trying to figure out what senior person I should work with. And instead, this fantastic postdoc at the time, Ava Maria Schatz Collins, maybe some of you know her, and I were there at the same time. And we were both sort of looking for senior people to work with on our projects. We sort of had independent postdocs and we decided each other was the senior person who we would work with <laughs> on our project. So we did this biophysics project on surface tension and biological tissues and coerced a few other people into thinking about it with us. And it was just so great not to have any real adults in the room. Um, it was bad too, because there wasn't anyone who know what yeah, well, even Maria know what she was doing, but I didn't know what I was doing. So it was a little bit hectic. And the other thing that happened that was really huge for me is, is that I still wanted to work on soft matter and that would be important for me to get a job later. And um, I was having trouble making connections in that area. And Andrea Liu was a hero and basically made a, a, a place in her, she gave me a desk at UPenn so I could go and visit there every so often. And really basically I would say sort of helped to save my career because I really needed the voice of a senior person to say that what I was doing wasn't completely crazy. Um, and so um, I, I really, I, I, I have these like sort of powerful, amazing like women mentors in my life who have really made an impact at critical choices and, and she was one of them. 
Okay, so then I made it to Syracuse University. So um, we, you know, I had to solve another two body problem with my partner who's also an academic. I've worked on all sorts of fun things there. I still worked on biological tissues. I started getting interested in dense active matter. I do disordered networks, still work on class physics. And um, I now do some administrative stuff as director of an institute. So I got to do all of that fun stuff at Syracuse. And again, I would say that like a lot of this stuff, like um, for example, Christina Marchetti was at Syracuse and she, I think did a great job of just going out of her way to sort of include me in opportunities that she had and sort of making sure I was a voice in the room and she didn't have to. And Karen's here, so I'm a little embarrassed to say this, but like Karen was also just such a proponent of like whenever I asked her a question, she never made me feel like I was asking a dumb one. And so there was, and, and Michael Falk. So these are the group of people that I think really were important sort of for helping me to um, think about what I wanted to do. And then also um, helping to sort of put me in the room where interesting things were going on. And so I'm just so appreciative of that. Um, so I think I have like two more minutes. Is that right, Sri? One more? Yeah, go for it. Okay. So the, the thing I wanted to say, I just wanted to make sure I was okay on time. So, so the things that, um, that, um, this, that, that I think I wanted to share in my history, I sort of emphasize throughout for me anyways, mentoring is one of the most important things, but to sort of allude back to what Juan said, I think peer mentoring is actually like really, really key. And so I have this QR code here because um, I wanted to uh, mention that I have a peer mentoring group here at Syracuse of people who are faculty members that all joined as faculty at Syracuse about the same time I did. And that sort of interactions with peers has been just as important. And, you know, I've actually, in some of my other friends in this group, have tried to seed these types of groups at other institutions because they're, they're hugely valuable in, in many ways. And so this QR code is linked to an article if you want to figure out about ways to like mentor other people. Um, but the sort of other than mentoring, the other things that I wanted to maybe mention, and it's very related to what Juan already said, which is, and and, and actually Regina too, I think, uh, with the teaching is, is that do things because you want to, not because you think you should. Um, and, and I would add to that because some people um, think that maybe personal reasons is not to be included in that list. And I think that, you know, the thing I want to say is you never know what's going to happen. Um, you know, if you're weighing two choices and like you think that X is better professionally, like sometimes it won't turn out that X is better professionally. And so thinking about the holistic way to make choices, I think, is is really key because you're like your personal life and your happiness matters <laughs> when you're doing those things. And similarly to what's been said earlier, you know, if you're excited about something, you should find a way to work on it even when everyone else thinks it's crazy or not important, because ultimately that's what's going to make you feel fulfilled and happy. And often if you're doing something orthogonal to everyone else, that's a way to make a new type of discovery, right? You know, if you're doing something really different, it's maybe not the worst thing. Um, and the other thing I wanted to sort of say, because again, I, I sort of talked to a lot of people, especially, you know, during COVID, that it's okay to step back sometimes. Like you're, you know, a career is a book with many chapters and, uh, you know, ability is a temporary condition. We often think about disabilities, right? But ability is really the temporary thing, right? And so if something is going on and you have to take a step back because of family, because of illness, because of whatever it is, the world will go on and you can come back. Um, and I think sort of just giving yourself some grace when that's happening. I've definitely had to do that myself multiple times for various reasons. And the last thing I, I'm still realizing as I sort of, you know, I'm I'm trying to do this and would like to do this better. But, you know, when when I'm able to make space for other people, so I have a picture here of the folks in my research group uh, at, our, at our bowling alley outing a few weeks ago. Like I find that when I make space for others to talk and get tell me their experiences, especially trainees, especially younger folks, I really usually learn way more than when I don't make that space for them and try to sort of tell them my perspective. So that's it. Uh, thank you so much, Lisa, on behalf of the audience. Oh, I'm clapping. Um, in the interest of time, I'll ask you a super quick question uh, and give you a chance to tell us about this um, point you made about early on in your career about um, not 
necessarily knowing the norms that a deep insider or a child of a deep insider might have known about how academia works and having to figure it all out and having to wing it. And would you please tell us a little bit about whether you feel things have changed for people in that position now and what do you advise? Yeah, uh, you know, I I think that it's true that there's a lot of sort of insider knowledge that people have that others don't have. And I think that um, like my feeling, I mean, so it's it's never a level playing field. It's just not. If somebody knows all the rules and you don't, it's just going to be harder. Um, but I think one of the things that like having served on like search committees and things like that now and bringing in like first generation people as faculty members, like if you have a clear, like at least for me, like if you have really good mentoring policies so that peers can share knowledge, that's one way to help drive information a lot more broadly. And then also having really clear rubrics for what it is you really care about in people that you're evaluating then that can get rid, I think, of some of the biases of having that insider knowledge. Yeah. Thank you so much. On that note, I am closing the recording.